I know everyone can hear me, probably more than they wanted to. There we go. Um, yes. Okay. Working through technical difficulties real quickly. We good? Excellent. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, let's begin with prayer, please. Our Father and our Lord, we are constantly reminded of your presence, the fact that you have created us to be your people, and as such, you want to equip us in such a way to be pleasing to you, but to prepare us for an eternal life in your presence. And as we pray for wisdom this morning, we pray for uh, your indulgence in that, as you have promised in James that you will provide us that wisdom. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. All right, good. So, the three-month rule still in effect? Haven't changed anything there. In fact, for those eagle-eyed viewers who were here for the opening salvo of class, you'll recognize that I've changed the title actually of this one uh, from joy and contentment to hope because I believe as the class lays itself out, that's the right thing for us to talk about this morning. And I, I've struggled as you can imagine with how I've wanted to teach the class. Um, what I feel is I've owed you an explanation. It's one thing to say that there is a fundamental thing that should be in the back of your mind going on in each of life's aspects that is a responsibility and obligation now that we have Christians. And then I could just come in and say, and here it is. But my intent, as it was last week, and my intent will be as this week, and each successive week is to get approval for that, is to prove to you why I believe that that particular obligation or responsibility is the appropriate one that goes along with this life aspect. So we're going to take the exact same approach that we did last week. We're going to build incrementally on top of that to get to why I believe uh, this is the appropriate aspect that we're supposed to have, or appropriate responsibility for that aspect. So let's recap real quickly what we talked about last week, which is, again, we have our 11 aspects that we're going to talk about. We discussed spirituality, and we said that we have a responsibility or an obligation now as a Christian. We're not just putting on that, that thin veneer, correct? We're not just putting up our trophy case of virtue and activities. Jesus did that for us. We're already viewed in God's eyes through the lens of Jesus the Christ, so we don't have to do that anymore. We don't have to earn that. We are to be new people, new men, something completely different than we were before. Not just a better version of ourselves. We are supposed to do the will aside, the killing of our will to be something completely different, to be consumed and overwhelmed by the will of God. And what we said was that spiritual aspect, the spiritual responsibility, that Christian aspect, was we would choose. It's simply a choice. I don't know how to see God's hand in everything, but I choose to. I choose to. Even in my doubts, even in my fears, even in the good things, even in the bad things, I choose to see somehow God is working through the Spirit to make something new in me. Sanctification, I think, is the word for that. And we said the beautiful outcome of that, if we're able to have that mindset, is we can see His hand in everything because we understand we still get to have our choices but we thankfully can rely on him to handle the outcomes. Because you, you, have two, you have a couple opposites there on the spectrum, right? You can either believe everything is predestined and you have no control and then you're apathetic. Like, what difference does it make? Good or bad is irrelevant in that point because my actions are not my own. You can go to the other end, which is paranoia, which would be if I knew that my actions and the things that I wanted controlled the future, I'd be terrified to get out of bed. Because I know my thoughts and my actions and my desires. And they're terrifying enough without the helping hand of God. Or we can have what comes with choosing to see God's hand in everything. It's freedom. I don't understand it. I don't have to understand it. Someday I might. But someday I won't care to understand it. Because that's what heaven will be to us. So God is not a vending machine. He's not a magic eight ball that occasionally when we have some need, we shake and we say, here, God, tell us what it is. Go eat pizza. Whatever comes up when you do those magic eight balls. But 
he is also not a magic eight ball, and also he's, he helps us in a different way. It's not just that he gives us answers, it's that he helps us to become people that already start out making good decisions, which is a most wonderful place to be. We talked about all of those things that come out, and at the end, you have this result of being perfect, lacking in nothing. God creates in us the ability to be people who make good decisions from the start, not have to constantly be begging him to give us an answer to do anything. Now, real quickly, because a good point came up after class, when we talked about Romans 8, I don't say God is working out everything good in your life, which means you're going to have a happy life. There is no indication of that in Scripture. I know of not a single indication in Scripture that says your life is going to be perfect and it's going to be happy and you're going to be without sorrow. In fact, it's just the opposite. It says those of who follow Christ will be persecuted. The intent and understanding from what we're talking about, particularly in Romans, everything God is working out for good, is the good is the ultimate outcome. We're going to get to heaven where we can be in his unfiltered presence. So I wanted to say there, and that is my lead-in to what we're going to talk about this week. Health. The aspect of physical health. Everybody has this. If you are a physical body, this is an aspect in your life. In fact, we have a gentleman here this morning whose living is made by nothing else than telling people how sick they are. (laughs) Just kidding, just kidding. But he is equipped in such a way by the wisdom of God to help them live better. What a wonderful thing. What a wonderful thing that we all have these physical bodies, and even though we're in the process of decay, we have knowledge that is passed along so we can enjoy this as much as we can. So when I say physical health, just out of curiosity, what springs to mind? What do you think about? Exercise. Guy, yeah, absolutely. How much I choose to eat, which is a lot, more than I need, many times over. So here's the definition of it. You know I love my Webster's Dictionary. The state of being hale, and I had no idea what that word was. It means robust. Pull that one off at work. There's a great new word for you. Say, I'm feeling hale today. Uh, uh, Sounds are whole in body, mind, and soul, especially the state of being free from physical disease or pain. Seems reasonable. So how has man met this need? How do we meet this need to be free from physical pain or disease or to feel sound in body, mind, and soul? These are not trick questions, I promise you. If it's a trick question, you'll know. Well, we have, guys, good sleep, exercise, and, yeah. Peaceful, yes. As always, Jason, the good pitch man. He has not seen these slides today either. It's fantastic. Excellent points. I appreciate that. So let's talk about what people do, the cost of fitness, whatever fit means to you in your definition. I don't know if you can see all that slide, but there's this Global Wellness Institute. And the really interesting thing there is, from a worldwide perspective, the way people in this world choose to try to understand fitness and wellness, it is an industry of four and a half trillion dollars a year. Diet, going to spas, and minerals, and whatever else people do, and and all of the industry associated with that. In this country alone, it's nearly a third of a trillion dollars that we spend in this country alone to try to be fit and to try to be well. So certainly physical health and this this physical aspect of life is something that we're all very, very tuned to. And I want to talk really about being attuned to that. It's so pervasive, particularly in our society. Um, And forgive me, Alan, I didn't get a chance to run these by you, but... uh, I did, from at least from the research that I had, that suggested that from all 
teenagers that have admitted to suicidal thoughts, that one in eight of those was driven by body image. And certainly, as we understand because of COVID and everything we've seen um, over the last two years in particular, that's just the tip of the iceberg, that it is driving that, that people are, are driven to that type of communication because we haven't been able to, to see each other. But here's an interesting one from the uh, Canadian Medical Association. It says, it implicates smartphone and social media use and the increase in mental distress, self-injurious behavior, and suicidality, suicidality among youth. So there's a suggestion then, not only are we attuned to how we want to look and how we want to be and how we want to feel, that's the only thing we show to people, and then we get on these devices and we only see the good. <laughs> we never see the truth behind that or what it takes to get there or what they're sacrificing or how happy they really are. And so we increase the pool of suicidal thoughts, and it suggests then that we are increasing the pool, particularly in teens' minds, of people who just can't seem to be happy with their physical self. This is a very pervasive issue, and it's, I would suggest in, our, in most affluent societies. I'll say it that way. So what does the Bible say about this? Do you not know that the body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? Dear friend, I pray that all may go well with you, and that you may be in good health, just as it is well with your soul. For physical exercise has some value, but godliness is valuable in every way. It holds promise for the present life and for the life to come. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do everything for the glory of God. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It's better to lose one of your members than to have your whole body thrown into hell. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It's better to lose one of your members than to have the whole body go to hell. I doubt Jesus was really trying to describe self-mutilation. But I think he was making a very stark point there that I think the other scriptures say. The Bible doesn't seem to care near as much about the body as we do. <laughs> doesn't seem to be interested in how we feel about ourselves and whether our abs can show and all those other wonderful things or the fact that we would spend all day long comparing ourselves to other people. In fact, it would suggest that's sinful spending all day on those things, comparing ourselves to other people. So let's dig a little deeper. What about the Apostle Paul, someone who's not God incarnate? Talking to Timothy, he said, stop drinking just water, but use a little wine for your digestion and your frequent illnesses. I don't want to debate about Christians drinking. That's not the point of this. What I want to point out for you is he said your frequent illnesses, and he didn't say pray to God to have them removed. It comes with the territory. We are physical beings. We have physical illness. Paul didn't tell Timothy to get rid of it. Therefore, so I would not become arrogant, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to trouble me so that I would not become arrogant. I asked the Lord three times about this, that it would depart from me, but he said, my grace is enough for you. The scripture doesn't seem to be all concerned about physical health in the way that we are. I always joked, I've heard the joke about this, and I can't let the opportunity pass up, that Paul's thorn in the flesh was his wife. But, see, it's funny. Come on. Come on. Sorry, babe, I, can't, I couldn't help myself. Uh, <laughs> oh, no. Um, <laughs> yeah, thank you. So what about C.S. Lewis? I, I, I love C.S. Lewis. I, I think C.S. Lewis books should be mandatory, although I didn't start reading them until I was in my 30s, but they're, they're fantastic. It says, I do not think that equality is one of those things like wisdom or happiness, which are good simply in themselves and for their own sakes. I think they're in the same class as medicine, which is good because we are ill, and clothes which are good because we are no longer innocent. Medicine labors to restore natural structure or normal function, but greed, egoism, self-deception, and self-pity are abnormal in the same sense as astigmatism or a floating kidney. For who in heaven's name would describe as natural or normal any man from whom these failings were wholly absent? He has such an eloquent way of putting things. Ultimately, broken health is our nature. <laughs> it's who and what we are. We live in a fallen world, and it shapes our lives. So I want to prove that to you, particularly that last statement. I'm going, to, I'm going to back up. Broken health is our nature, but that last part of it shapes our lives. 
So you've certainly heard the term the spirit in the flesh. From Romans 8, it says, So that righteous requirement of the law may be fulfilled in us, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh have their outlook shaped by the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit have their outlook shaped by the things of the Spirit. Now the works of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, depravity, adultery, sorcery, hostility, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish rivalries, dissensions, factions, envying, murder, drunkenness, carousing, and similar things. I am warning you, as I warned you before, those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. This physical reality that we are born into, that comes through this broken down world, it drives us. And the scripture says that every impure and ugly thing, everything against him, stems from that fact. All of, oh, I didn't sleep well last night, and my shoulder's hurting, my allergies are driving me nuts. All those little things, or I'm great, and I'm in need of nothing else. And I certainly don't have time to praise right now. I've got things to go do because I feel so great. All the good, all the bad, all the physicality, everything associated with the flesh, everything. Oh, did mine not? Sorry, there they are. Have their outlook shaped by the things of the flesh. That's why it's so important to us. (laughs) That's why it's so pervasive. That's why the world spends four and a half trillion dollars a year trying to feel good. Because no one wakes up in the morning and thinks, man, I'd love to have a stomach ache, and I'd love to have a runny nose, and I would love to have broken arms and legs, because it makes me feel better. And I'm so nice to people when all those things are like that. Y'all need to tell me if the slides aren't moving forward. I can't see over my shoulder. So I want to instruct, again, building, I know, I'm building, I'm sorry. I'm trying to prove to you that this is the right aspect to think about as it comes to physical health. But I want to talk to another C.S. Lewis um, thought, and he was men without chest. Has anybody read this? Anybody heard this? It seems very strange. Chest is not men without physical, it's not men with their head on their torso. Let's, let's talk through this for a little bit, because there's a point to all this. So, we've already concluded from Bible suggesting, and the Apostle Paul suggesting, it's not terribly concerned about the body. In fact, it says, if it's getting in your way, you'd be better to cast off your concerns about it. It does that metaphorically through saying, pluck out your eye and cut off your arm, a wonderful thing. The scripture tells us that we are driven by our bodily needs. We are driven, and all that sin is rooted out of that, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life, all comes from that. So the body, with its desires, is the wellspring of our rebellion. It is the source. It is... I would suggest it's the, one of the greatest tools the devil uses to tempt us and push us off the mark. So C.S. Lewis said, Until modern times, all teachers and even all men believed the universe to be such that certain emotional reactions on our part could be either congruous or incongruous to it. Believed, in fact, that objects did not merely receive but could merit our approval or disapproval, our reverence or our contempt. In other words, he was suggesting there are things that we can see and that we can run into because of what they are, just due to their own nature, they deserve a certain response for us. No justification of virtue will enable a man to be virtuous, though. Without the aid of trained emotions, the intellect is powerless against the animal organism. So we may need to respond in certain ways to certain things, But we can talk about virtue, we can say these wonderful things, and we know how we should respond. But it says, without the aid of trained emotions, the intellect is powerless against, as he calls it, the animal organism, the flesh, the thing that's driving us. That's the wrong way. So the head rules the belly, the chest, that's the men with the chest, the seat of emotions, organized by trained habit, and to stable sentiments. These are indispensable liaison offers between the cerebral man and the visceral man. It may even be said that it is by this middle element that man is man. For by his intellect he is a mere spirit, and by his appetite he is a mere animal. There's got to be something then that bridges the spirit and this physical prison that we're in right now. It's a wonderful gift, but it is driving us 
and we expect it to be perfected when Christ returns. And so then he says, here's the outcome of this. When we tell people that you don't need to have these trained emotions to separate the spirit and this physical man that we are, he says, you make men without chests. You teach kids. You teach people to not have these trained emotions. And you expect virtue and enterprise. We laugh in honor and shock to find traitors in our midst. We castrate and bid the geldings be fruitful. If we are to be the kind of people that Christ asks us to be, and to be responsible to this new obligation that we have been given, we have to be people of trained emotions. Not just mere spiritual beings. It's one thing, again, to have my trophy case of good works and virtue. It's another thing to bridge that in this man that I'm stuck in. The one that loses his hair. The one that has hair growing out of his ears that grows faster than everywhere else. It is so annoying. It's so annoying. Sorry, I'm just, I, it's just so annoying. We have to have something that bridges the gap between everything that God is asking us to be and the spirit inside of us and this us that we are that is this wellspring of rebellion. Make sense so far? Have any problem with my logical progression? We'll get there again. Gosh, I'm so glad you're here. <laughs> It's perfect. Yes, I mean, ultimately, we're getting there. We're getting there. But yeah, it's a um, fantastic pitch, man. So, yes, fulfilling the aspect. So we're getting right in there. We must develop trained emotions to overcome the animal beneath. Exactly what you're suggesting. And I say that, I use some of C.S. Lewis's language here. There, there is the animal underneath. underneath. If, if you've um, ever taken any training on um, trying to handle a conflict resolution or a very difficult conversation, say, with an employee, what do they always say? That if things get heated, your, you, your mind takes over and they call it the animal brain. That's the terminology they use. And the animal brain turns you into fight or flight. You cannot have a good conversation when your mind is in fight or flight. So when you're angry with someone or you're doing this, you're doing that verbal jousting, and you see it on the internet played out in all the comments, it's fight or flight. It is impossible to receive information. It is impossible to give good information. Your only desire there is to survive, and you will kill everything around you. And so they teach us things, the one that works the best, believe it or not. If you feel your temperature rising and you want to talk to somebody, put your tongue at the roof of your mouth. It's unreal. If you're feeling to get up, you know, just stand there and put your tongue at your roof of your mouth. And it's crazy how quickly it will pull you back down from that fight or flight. It's, it's a, I'm sure Alan could explain it a lot better, but it is a physical thing. When your, your emotions rise, when your temperature rises, and you're wanting to have a conversation, you cannot. You cannot have a conversation. You can certainly attack. You can certainly defend, but you can't have a conversation. So we must develop trained emotions to overcome that. Interestingly enough, the U.S. has spent a quarter of a billion dollars on mental wellness in 2019. I couldn't find the numbers for 2020. I'm sure it's even more than that. A quarter of a billion, I'm sorry, a quarter of a trillion. A quarter of a trillion dollars on this thing we call mental well-being. Just to, it's not just about body, but it's, do I feel good about the day? Am I happy? A quarter of it, this is just in America. There's what, 330 million people in the country? I mean, everybody's spending a dollar. I mean, everybody's spending a thousand dollars. It's ultimately what that means. So, what does the Bible say to fulfill that? It says, guard your heart with all vigilance, with all vigilance, for from it are the sources of life. Not only is it the source of our rebellion, but if we guard our hearts with our vigilance, it is also the source of life. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Romans 12, 2. And renew here is an interesting word. It actually means to change for the better. It's kind of like renovation, which is near and dear to my heart right now because that, <laughs> that seems to be what my life is at the moment. Good outcome, but it is consuming at times. But that's what it's saying. It's basically going in and saying, take out the countertops in your old kitchen of your mind and throw them to the side and tape off everything paint them and prepare them for new countertops. I'm getting just the worst look right now from my wife. <laughs> it's 
She's a good sport. So, guard the heart then, renew the mind. That's easy, right? <laughs> it's so simple. We've built up this logic chain and we've gotten to the end of it and the answer's right before us. So, ah, look how easy this is. So this is a question. Why do we still struggle with hope and faith and love? We understand all this. Why do we still struggle? Everybody here? She was basically suggesting, particularly everybody in some ways experienced this during COVID, was isolation. Sometimes it's a lot easier to um, feel confident and have the spirit and not be pushed aside by the flesh um, when you're not exposed to a lot of things. Um, I would suggest, though, having children in the home, and I'm, I'm, my children are no different than others. They have their growth that I had to go through as well. You're not quite as isolated. In fact, it's more condensed. It's the stronger orange juice. It's the condensed version that comes in the little cylinder um, when you're on top of each other. But point well taken. Certainly our exposure to things um, make that more difficult. Yes, sir. Oh, that's excellent. No, and it went back to your comment earlier about training. And certainly training, you don't see an Olympic athlete you know, train for a day and then take off a week. It just doesn't work. They would not be able to compete. No, that's an excellent point. Please do. Yes, sir. Thank you for that. And I, it's interesting related to the next question then. Where is our peace? And here's someone nearly a century <laughs> trying to take care of someone who's in the same decade. <laughs> 93 years old. Where is our peace then? This all makes sense. It's so simple. Good. 
ma'am? Too much negativity. There's certainly plenty of it to go around, isn't it? Yes, ma'am. That's a fair point. That's a good point, too. The, the suggestion there is those are the things that sharpen the iron. Those are the things, the difficulties in life are the one thing that makes us appreciate when we see those virtues and then we want to emulate them ourselves, certainly. So I, oh, go ahead. Yeah, no, please. Yeah. What's the acronym in that thing? No, the acronym. I can't remember the acronym he uses in that book. If I'm thinking of the, I'm thinking of a different book. No, go ahead. I'm thinking of a different book. She's stealing your throne now. She's a good pitch woman now. Go ahead. He gets it back, sorry. You were, you were there for a little bit, but he got it back. No, no, I, I'm, I appreciate the comments. Yeah. It's quick. Sorry. Go ahead. Okay, Dr. Baggett comes off the top rope and takes the belt. So last week, we talked about the aspect of life as the spirituality of it. And I said that was foundational, and I still believe it. We said what that is, is we have to choose to see God. We have to. We don't know it, and we can't know it, but it's a choice. 
but it's a fundamental choice because it affects the way we pray. It affects the way we act to other people. It affects everything we do if we can see God's hand in that. And again, good does not mean happiness. It means eternal salvation, and that's probably as good a definition of good as you're going to get. Choose to order our doubts with being God at work, even when we don't understand what's going on or why. We choose to say, God is at work in my life in this. I don't get it. I don't like it. The Bible is replete with, I don't like it, God, take it away. God never condemns that. Because you talk to God that way, because why? You expect him to be able to do something about it. That's what he wants from us. So this is not earth shattering, but the health aspect then, when we choose to see, now we have to choose to hope. And it goes to what you were saying. It is not a logical thing at times to see that. We have to choose to order our mind to accept what is to come, which is a fancy way of saying, turn your eyes upon heaven. Let me explain that just a little bit more. Hope. For in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, but who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with endurance. For I know what I have planned for you, says the Lord. I have plans to prosper you, not to harm you. I have plans to give you a future filled with hope. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you believe in Him, so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And as Jason read, Therefore, since we have been declared righteousness by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have also obtained access to this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in the hope of God's glory. Not only this, but we also rejoice in sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, endurance character, character, and hope. And hope does not disappoint. We don't believe it. We just don't believe God's going to give us what he says he's going to give us. But hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit has given us. And let's understand something. Very Biblical hope is not to wish for. Or expect without certainty. That's how we hope today. Oh, it's like at Christmas. I hope I get a pony. That is not biblical hope. That is not scriptural hope. Scriptural hope is a strong and confident expectation. So when you go back and you read these scriptures again, whoop, one too many. For I have a strong, for in hope we are saved. I have the strong expectation. I expect to be saved. And I eagerly await for that with endurance. I have a future in me of being able to walk around knowing the outcome. Now the God, the infinite God of certainty, tells me that I should abound in that. That I should walk around with that knowledge of Him in my life. And everything else that we go through and that we could ask for when we want, it produces this ability. All the trials that y'all talked about and how that produces that character gives us this one thing, to walk around with expectation. I can see God in the world around me, and I can see what is to come. And that is not a wishy-washy thing. This is not a rent cycle. I'm going to heaven. I'm going to heaven. I just want you all to know that, in case you didn't. Jason Wagner, Jason Douglas Wagner, is going to heaven. I'm going to be there. You may be disappointed to see me there, but I'm going to be there. So I call this title, period, the end of the story. Say it with me. I am going to heaven. Say it. Can you say it? Say it. Are you embarrassed to say? Thank you. Thank you. I hope you have no job. I'm going to heaven. <laughs> Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I'm going to heaven. I'm there. I'm there. Do you believe it? Do you really believe it? Do you live by it? Do you live because of it? Not respond. Not let every tidal wave come and hit you you live because of that assurance? Do you? Really? I'm terrible at it. This is my three-month rule. 
this has caused me to condense all these thoughts that I've been having for so long into some way to describe it to others. But this is it. Period. This is it. Period. Thank you. So let's wrap up and say, and here's the wonderful thing that comes from that. When you can take on the responsibility and the obligation that's given to you as a Christian for the physical aspect of your life, to hope, to confidence, hope. What comes from that? And this is why I changed the title. These aren't the drivers. This is not the ticker tape thing you should be thinking about. This is the result. Joy. Biblical joy is a calm delight. Calm delight. You have not seen him, but you love him. You do not see him now, but you believe in him. And so you rejoice with an indescribable and glorious calm delight. A joyful heart is good medicine. <laughs> Can y'all shut that door, please? Hello? Can y'all shut the door, please? A joyful heart is good medicine, but a broken spirit dries up the bones. Therefore you too have grief now, but I see you again, and your heart will rejoice, and no one will take your joy away from you. This is what Christ said to his apostles before he was crucified. Yeah. Ah! I'm too busy fussing at people. There we go. Therefore, and it's even in red. <clears throat> Jesus said it. It has to be in red. The other outcome, contentment. And this is a major struggle for me. And the definition of that is sufficient for oneself. That doesn't mean egotistical. It means there's enough there or sufficient for one's lot. For what's been given to you, that's sufficient. The Lord is my shepherd. Boom. Therefore, I will not want. Not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content. In whatever circumstances I am, I know how to get along with humble means and I know how to live in prosperity in any and every circumstance. I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Therefore, I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties for Christ's sake, for I am weak. Then I am strong. And the only way to have that, as I call it, the biblical medicine, the only real medicine is accepting heaven is yours. Period. That's it. And that is the only way you can live like nobody else truly lives. Thank you for your time.